Hi everyone, it's Guillaume from Startup Basecamp. Welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. During the show, you will have the opportunity to meet the best climate tech founders, investors, and experts from both Silicon Valley and around the globe. They will share with you their stories and personal journeys into this growing and exciting industry, giving you some insight into the ecosystems that help you to take part in the fight against climate change and benefit from the opportunities it can represent. Podcast is divided in two small interviews. During the first part, you will get to know our speakers, their perspectives on the climate crisis and how climate tech is changing the game. Second part of the discussion will be for members of our community who will learn the speakers' secret sauce on how to and share with you their unique expertise on topics such as fundraising, management, strategy and so on to help you to become a better leader in your field. So before we start, I would like to quickly share what we are doing at Startup Basecamp to support climate tech founders in accessing resources and gaining visibility with investors they seek. Our initiatives include a membership-based community platform offering access to a dedicated Slack group with a growing number of founders, experts and investors from around the world and a series of exclusive content such as interviews, weekly job listings, events, and our quarterly online pitch of night opportunity. But more than a place where you can learn, exchange, and grow, we are building a matchmaking service to facilitate connections between our members and top investors and experts in the field. And soon, alongside with other top investors, we will be launching a small fund to co-invest in the growth and acceleration of our members. Finally, all of this is possible because of your support and donations. We are a small self-funded team and we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. So please share one episode with a friend and subscribe to the channels. As an added bonus, we will plant a tree for each of our subscribers each time we reach 1,000 new fans or donors. Do not hesitate to connect with me via social media or email guillaume at Startup Basecamp. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope to get in touch with you soon. And now, let's go for the show. Hi, everyone. In this episode, we are speaking with Priya Shah, general partners at Terra Ventures. Terra Ventures is a seed stage climate tech fund based in India, looking at all verticals in climate tech with a specific interest in companies that are working in IP-led technology-based ventures. The Ventures is a very thought-driven fund and aims to be one of the early movers in the climate tech space in India, which offers Priya a good perspective into this fast-growing space. I was thrilled to have Priya on the show and learn more about her story. Priya has over 15 years of experience in the impact investing space, which began when she started the SG Working Group at Bloomberg, back when the concept was often overlooked. She then worked in the impact investing space in India, including working for an off-the-grid solar energy startup, an experience that gave her a good look at issues of energy access in India. In this episode, Priya used us in considerable experience to not only explain the genesis and model of Tear Ventures, but also how it plays a bigger role in the climate tech space in India. In doing so, she offers a fascinating look at the Indian climate tech landscape to different sectors, roadblocks and drivers of growth. This analysis informs her discussion of impact, how India is an important piece of the climate challenge and how she measures impact to make sure to position their venture at the forefront of India's effort to leapfrog the US and the EU in reaching net zero. The second part of the show, Priya explains her approach to investing and what tips she has for founders. She explains also what she does to manage her work-life balance as a busy investor and a mom, what books she recommends for clarity in addressing the climate crisis. Priya, welcome to the show. Hi Priya, welcome to the Tech for Climate podcast. I'm super happy to have you here with us today. And even, even more as uh, we are collaborating uh, on a deep dive on the climate tech ecosystem that we will be releasing soon on our blog. So I'm looking forward to this uh, great opportunity to hear your story and get up to speed on what you guys are looking at with the adventure. So welcome to the show. 
Thank you so much. Really excited to be here. So before we start, uh, that's the tradition. Uh, could you please give us a 30 second introduction about TerraVenture? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Thea Ventures is a seed stage climate tech fund uh, based in India, and we look at all sort of verticals within climate tech. So electric mobility, battery tech, renewables, uh, green hydrogen, material innovation, sustainable textiles, sustainable fashion, packaging, um, uh, carbon accounting, property tech, and uh, grid innovation. So we're looking to back companies that are doing um, really interesting IP-led technology-based ventures in this space and watch them grow, provide them you know capital but also non-capital assistance and um and be part of the one of the early movers um in the climate tech ecosystem in india so let's start from the the top uh, you know that uh, in the show we love to put uh, you know the, the speaker as a human at the center of the interview so can you tell us a bit more about your uh, personal story and background what are you passionate about uh you know what do you do and what love to do uh, besides supporting and investing in uh, in founders i mean what makes you feel uh, inspired or your best self as i always ask like who is priya Right. <laughs> um, no, thank you for that question. So just a little bit about my background. Um, I have about 15 years experience working across financial services and impact investing and startups um, across the world. So I started my career in New York at Bloomberg um, in the data department, um, looking at earnings estimates for buy side and sell side clients. Um, and I was actually part of the ESG working group um, at Bloomberg when back in 2008, when ESG was not a very well known term. Um, people were more interested in you know, the subprime mortgage crisis and the upcoming recession. Uh, so had sort of uh, thought about, you know, having an impact on climate back then in 2008, and then gradually made my way um, to move back to India and worked in the impact venture space uh, for about six years, and then also had a chance to work in a startup in the clean tech energy space. So it was an off-grid solar energy startup that did uh, basically prepaid metering for off-grid households in India. And there I really got a sense of, um, you know, how, uh, how sort of deep the energy access issue is at that particular time. Energy access and the prevalence of the grid um, was something that, um, you know, in rural India was really something that you know many companies were trying to address. Um, and I think now the, the sort of conversation has really shifted into, you know, most people have access to energy. It's more stability of the grid and resilience of that energy and, and making sure that we move away from coal-fired, centralized, um, you know, the distribution of energy to um, decentralized clean energy. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that, you know, I've been observing over the last decade uh, working in the space and had the chance to be on the investor side as well as the startup side. So these are the kinds of things that sort of led me to think about starting up our own fund uh, on, on climate. And basically now is a, is a really timely uh, you know, period to actually be investing in these companies because the, the quality of founders, um, the regulatory environment, there's a lot of favorable pieces uh, pushing forward the climate agenda in India. So very excited to be part of it. Um, and in terms of you know what makes me tick, uh, so I'm a big reader. So I read sort of many, many articles and news and uh, podcasts, and I'm, I'm very much a, a big devourer of content. So we like to think of, you know, Thea Ventures as being a very thought leadership oriented fund. So it, we think very deeply about the type of investments we make, about the, the type of assistance that we're providing our portfolio companies and the type of messages that we're sharing, um, you know, with our followers in the ecosystem. So that is one piece that we want to be differentiated uh, um, as, you know, in, in, in the fund space. And uh, we'll definitely come back, uh, you know, into uh, all of that more in detail uh, later in the in the interview. So uh, you already mentioned, like, you know, a little bit like the, the timeline and your different like work life experience. But if you could, like, you know, step back and just take like one or two, uh, you know, pieces of uh, experience that you had during that uh, journey that, in a way, gave you an edge to start uh, to start the fun. What would it be? Yeah. So um, I think. Uh, definitely working in the impact investing space um, has, has given me a really good window into how these different sectors, whether it's financial inclusion, education, livelihoods, etc., how they're converging with the with the more commercial capital. So early on, you know, many of these sectors and specifically uh, clean energy was also seen as more kind of impact driven, philanthropy driven, grant driven, etc., in terms of the type of capital that was going into these enterprises. And what's been really interesting to see, especially over the last two to three years, is that um, um, you know, with the advent of technology, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., um, you know, founders are actually getting a lot smarter about the way that they're building these businesses to address. Um, 
you know, these large social uh, issues, social and environmental issues. And they're actually able to build um, models that are, you know, uh, capable of exponential growth, uh, which makes it very attractive to a commercial investor that's looking for a certain you know rate of return and, and certain kind of um, growth trajectory uh, but what is interesting also is that um, you know in the climate space particularly uh, it's not as conventionally uh, I would say you know venture uh, driven or venture oriented you still have to take account of the fact that gestation periods are going to be a lot longer we can't look at you know quick exits out of companies because by nature climate businesses have to have an element of hardware manufacturing physical goods it can't be all done on, on you know platforms marketplaces, etc., um, as, as a sort of tra traditional internet businesses. So that kind of shift is something that's, um, that I've been able to observe, you know, in quite a, a close uh, way, being, being part of funds uh, that are looking at the traditional impact um, venture space, and then looking to see how we can develop our thesis um, at Thea Ventures. So that's one piece. And the second one is, as I mentioned before, working in a clean energy startup and actually um, being on the ground, seeing how, uh, you know, on the startup side of things, you know, the different challenges the startups face on fundraising, on operations, on sales, on collections, um, and being part of, uh, you know, that entire journey, especially in an energy company that has really given me a, a really strong, um, you know, perspective on the space. So uh, we always ask to, um, you know, also like, what are the, the deep motivation uh, behind, you know, moving into the, the, the climate tech uh, space? And you, you mentioned that, you, you know, you worked in the social space and the clean tech space already. But uh, uh, what was really like this, uh, you know, aha moment that you might have uh, or that you could define as such that really uh, ticked uh, in your life? And you said, OK, definitely, I want to dedicate now uh, at least a, a part of uh, my career or maybe your entire life to uh, try to contribute on uh, solving this uh, major issue that we're all facing now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think um, there are a couple of parts to this. One is that, um, you know, from a uh, sort of de dealing with early stage companies, so having that ability to work closely with founders, that's something that I've always wanted to do and always been excited to do in my uh, past sort of experiences, etc. Um, and building that ecosystem around, um, you know, around the startup community, but then also working on companies or working with companies that are actually facilitating a huge, hugely important um, change. And I think the climate is, you know, something that's really going to be uh, ad being addressed over the next two to three decades and absolutely needs to. I think we're seeing, as the IPCC came out with that report last year, stating that we've already reached 1.2 degrees of, of warming. And then if we reach 1.5, dangerous impacts are going to kick in. If we get to the five degrees, um, which is, you know, potentially going to happen, that's apocalyptic territory. So we are, you know, in a sort of very, very crucial time in our generation where if we don't fix these problems now, or at least attempt to and go through a mindset shift, um, it's going to make be drastic for, for the next generation. And I'm already seeing, you know, I have a son who's three years old, and I'm already seeing that in his lifetime, he's going to have to be a lot more attuned to uh, climate and circular issues. Uh, for example, in, in, you know, conserving water and recycling and transport, the way that he you know, moves around will have to be through electric transport rather than uh, through an he's going to have to just sort of make those decisions constant, constantly and consciously and think through those um, as, as a young uh, consumer and as a young actor in this ecosystem. So I think that um, that's really important as a, as a shift, but also on the business side, uh, it's been really clear that um, what was, you know, earlier with the Kyoto uh, Protocol and then eventually Paris Agreement, et cetera, over the last two decades, people are starting to see, and since the Rio Summit, actually in the early 90s, people didn't really think of climate as a pressing, pressing issue. And um, there wasn't that, you know, sense to move away from oil and fossil fuels, um, et cetera. But now in the last few years, especially since COP26 uh, conference last year, we're seeing a very dedicated shift um, on the part of policy and governments, which is starting to trickle down into public company and private company action. And, and large companies are now making these pledges to become net zero by 2030 and some by 2050. And so that's super encouraging. Um, and I think once we see that pervading across multiple different sectors, which, by the way, is not just in the renewables and energy transition space, but also mobility and transport and, you know, um, and buildings, property tech, as well as, um, you know, materials and waste management and water, etc. That's when we're going to actually hopefully see um, a change in, in the carbon agenda and, and the carbon basically reduction. So um, that's all very uh, sort of exciting, I think. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to jump into this um, this sort of path right now. Uh, so I see a lot of opportunity. I see a lot of great skills and founders, and I see a lot of great technology and the, the sort of pressing need of the problem, which is right now.
<laughs> so let's take a, a zoom, a zoom mm -hmm. out and, and, and a step back uh, at the Indian climatic ecosystem per se. Can, can you give us your uh, you know, overview of the, of the landscape today? I mean, what are the, the fundamentals that drive the, the, the ecosystem and the, and the market? And in a way, why should Indian care about it? I mean, meaning uh, not that they should not care about it, but what are the, you know, um, how important climate change uh, effects are already translated in day-to-day -day life of uh, the majority of the Indian population and how does it affect, uh, you know, the, the country and the GDP uh, in itself? And after that, when you, you know, will cover this, um, uh, those fundamentals, I'd like to uh, look a little bit deeper and try to understand Uh, where India stands today in climate tech ecosystem, in climate tech uh, in itself, um, and what are the different uh, sectors that you see uh, growth. But let's start with the, the fundamentals and like how climate change in a way it's affecting uh, the uh, Indian economy and the Indian population itself. Yeah, absolutely. So India is, as many of you know, um, the second largest population, populated country in the world after China. It's soon going to be the most populous country in this decade. Um, we're also seeing that India is basically the fourth largest carbon emitter in the world. So after the US, the EU and China, um, the next is India. So we are at a point where there is an absolute, you know, necessity for India to change the way that, um, you know, business is transacted in terms of the dependence on oil and fossil fuels, but also in the way that regular consumers are living their lives. Um, in terms of weather impacts, etc., we are seeing, you know, uh, drastic floods, we're seeing droughts, monsoons, um, heat waves as well, um, and pollution. I mean, pollution is one of the, the most, um, you know, I would say, uh, deep felt uh, issues um, in Indian urban centers right now. So Delhi, which is the capital of India, is one of the most polluted cities in the world. People really suffer, um, children suffer in terms of their breathing, like asthma. And in general, um, it's kind of all put together and led by population density as well as a built environment. So about 40% of all carbon emissions come from buildings. And in addition to that, I think um, transport and mobility. So what we're seeing, and that kind of gives me a little bit of a segue to the next point, which is how the climate tech ecosystem is, is shaping up. I think majority of it is also, you know, over the last decade, it was really driven by solar and investments into solar. So basically solar off-grid um, energy access, as I mentioned, utility scale solar, um, independent power production producers um, and solar rooftops. And that's still, you know, one of the largest um, areas within climate and has received uh, quite a lot of policy support, to, um, you know, since the last few years. So, you know, what earlier used to be um, subsidies on oil related, um, you know, alternatives to solar, which are basically the kerosene lamps, etc. And that, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, it made it very difficult to switch from kerosene to solar. Now, actually, we have a good, good level of um, unit cost has been driven down on solar. So, that those kinds of subsidies are really helping on the switch. Um, however, I think we need um, a lot more investment into solar um, as an asset class. So basically the upfront costs of solar are still pretty high. We need more financing um, you know, mechanisms and players to help to, to sort of um, stagger out that cost. And in addition to that, we need a larger ecosystem of solar rooftop Um, you know, users. So, for example, solar is only really profitable if you, as a consumer, you then become a producer of solar, and then you're able to trade that surplus of solar to other consumers. Um, and so that's that's sort of a, a large marketplace that can be built. So that's um, one piece. But I, I'm seeing a huge shift also in in the policy recognition of the pollution aspect that comes from mobility, which is um, leading to the second point that um, electric mobility is now uh, you know a massive government agenda. So the government wants um, all, and that starts with the fleet. So the government wants all fleets, commercial fleets, you know, delivery, um, transportation, logistics players to basically convert to become electric by 2030. So all 30% of all fleets will be electric. And you're already seeing that in, in you know, large fleets um, uh, that, that are sort of under management right now in the B2B segment. And then large incumbents, um, you know, in the autom automobile manufacturers that are all sort of pushing, um, you know, to become electric. So in India, um, as many countries in Asia, it's actually the EV revolution is led by the two wheelers and the three wheelers. So the scooters, which are the most um, most used transport in the country, rather than four wheelers, which are the regular cars. Uh, so that's where we see a huge shift, um, you know, in adoption, both on 
you know, business and consumer. And I think there's there's a lot of exciting um, movement as well in other sectors. So, for example, on the 1st of July, which is just a few weeks ago, um, the Indian government basically banned single-use plastics. Um, so brands and, you know, other uh, sort of e-commerce players are not allowed to actually use virgin plastic. Um, materials have to be innovated to either use paper or you know, recycled plastic or other alternative materials like bamboo and, um, you know, other types of packaging, seaweed, mushrooms, etc. So it's, it's kind of pushing the envelope a little bit on some of the changes that India needs to commit to um, as a country, both on the corporate level and the policy level, and now, you know, having these innovative, agile startups also um, making, a, you know, a forays into and, um, you know, help India achieve the, the net carbon zero emissions by 2070, which is where India has looked into, you know, made that commitment to. And just the last point I just wanted to say is that, you know, India is a very large country. It's a developing country. It is going to take a while to to get to net zero, but it's very encouraging to see the, the progress that's that's been made already. And the good thing in India is I think the government is very committed to it. Um, so unfortunately, in the US, you've seen some setbacks on the climate agenda, um, and the EU is also making those efforts to be, um, to sort of reach net zero and be sustainable across of the corporate world, but there are, you know, some ups and downs there. I think in India, there is that unilateral focus that we have to get to this goal. And India has the chance to actually leapfrog, I think, um, both, uh, you know, the US and EU and other countries and actually getting there faster, uh, given that we have a lot of innovation on the technology side, on the skills side, on startups, and then this policy and corporate um, shift as well. So uh, it's interesting what you what you mentioned in terms of like uh, mobility, you know, plastics in terms of like uh, you know the use of uh, solar, um, you know, uh, panels in terms of like energy production and in a way the decentralization of uh, the, the production in itself. But what would you be? And, and you mentioned this effort uh, of the government to you know uh, reach net zero by 2070 uh, in India, um, but. What do you, if you look at uh, the, the ecosystem in general, like what do you think that uh, is the advantages and, and the weaknesses uh, in regard of the decarbonization of the economy in itself? I mean, if you compare what uh, it's happening and uh, compared to maybe uh, other part of the world, like uh, the EU or the, or the US, I mean, do you see still roadblocks uh, compared to those uh, measures that you uh, mentioned of, uh, you know, uh, plastics, mobility and so on? Um, that still need to be overcome in order to really accelerate and reach that uh, 2070 uh, goal. And I guess this, um, I mean, those roadblocks could, uh, in a way, be translated in terms of uh, opportunities also for uh, companies to create, you know, uh, new stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I do think um, there are a few roadblocks and I'll, I'll go through each of them one by one. So one is, you know, we're dealing with a lot of old institutions here. So converting old institutions, old frame of mind thinking into new and nimble, you know, and forward looking futuristic um, forms of thinking. So that is always going to be a challenge. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example, which is, you know, in the power sector. So, you know, in the energy transition space, obviously, we've talked about buildings, we've talked about mobility, but, you know, fundamentally in the grid, the actual grid that supplies us electricity, if we are able to transition that from centralized coal to decentralized renewables um, and some kind of decentralized uh, clean energy storage as well, that's going to be a game changer. Um, but it's going to take a while because all of these large, um, you know, uh, sort of, private utilities and public utilities um, and power transmission and power generation players are all used to you know one type of uh, you know, one type of play when it comes to electricity so that's going to have to sort of go through some kind of uh, change and, and undergo some innovation and we're already already seeing a lot of um, you know good movement in that direction so for example there are private utilities in India like Adani and Tata Power that are doing a lot of work on experimentation with pilots, um, so battery energy storage and um, potential blockchain, um, you know, sort of uh, pilots as well on solar energy trading that they've done with uh, consumers and prosumers in, in particular uh, locations. Um, and then also looking at, you know, areas where they can participate with startups, so on smart metering. So we have a portfolio company in our, uh, that, that's been funded by us that works with um, Adani on Adani Electricity and also so at Dani Solar on uh, a bunch of smart metering, retrofitting, and also on um, on, on string sensor solars. So that's, that's one interesting piece as well. And we have some companies that are also working directly with power utility providers. Um, we call them DISCOMs and in 
India and helping them regulate wastage and, and sort of transmission of electricity to commercial and industrial buildings. So we're seeing some openness from these um, larger uh, players, which are more sort of old infrastructure and old school to help, tr you know, address the, the issues, the infrastructure issues and the outdated, um, you know, sort of players, uh, sort of uh, issues that they might have on the grid and transmission. Um, but we need a lot more of that. And secondly, I think the other roadblock that we have is really on, you know, getting the right type of R&D innovations to market. So in the US, for example, you have fantastic um, universities and labs like MIT and Stanford and Columbia and Harvard and others that have ready made, you know, uh, sort of entrepreneurs that are ready to go to market and you have a, you know professors that come to them with a sort of set of clients that they can already reach out to within you know the first month of them getting commercialized and that helps to get these uh, startups to market a lot faster whereas in India we still need to have that uh, just to build that kind of culture so basically um, having R&D that is acceptable um, to be scaled up and then having corporates that actually want to work with these R&D innovators and then go to market quickly um, and then eventually scale up these companies and that's really crucial in, in a sector like climate tech, which relies so much on, you know, patents and IP and, and um, you know, deep tech innovation. And I think that's what, something we need to learn from the U.S. and other countries on how to do that um, better here in India. But I, I do think that we have the talent and the skills. It's just um, access, really, um, in, in getting those in innovations to see the light of day. So, intrinsically, like uh, you mentioned, uh, energy again, uh, transportation, mobility, uh, but you didn't mention anything about uh, agriculture. Uh, how is the agriculture sectors and the opportunities in a way to have a positive impact uh, in terms of uh, climate change that uh, you see uh, could be an opportunity, should be changed, or it's already happening, some change, and you see interesting uh, companies there? because. I believe that uh, agriculture is uh, one of the big um, piece of the uh, Indian economy. Uh, and uh, how do you see that uh, relation between agriculture and uh, climate and climate tech in, uh, in general uh, right now in India? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so agriculture, you're absolutely right. It's it's a 70% of the Indian economy, so it's huge. There's a, a large employment, um, you know, of India's workforce in this space. I think there's two aspects to it. There's basically the pre-harvest and the post-harvest, um, you know, uh, sort of aspect of agriculture. So on post-harvest, I think there's been a lot of um, really great startups that have already, um, you know, uh, been become huge in terms of marketplace innovation. So connecting uh, the farmers to the buyers and then facilitating those uh, linkages, which has been great, and cutting out the middlemen that that helps um, you know get fresh produce um, to to the market faster, um, and eliminating efficiencies and capital efficiencies in in the uh, in the value chain. But then on the pre-harvest side, I think um, there are a lot. That's a lot of innovation that's going on with you know things like transitioning to from chemical fertilizers to organic ones. Um, you know, helping preserve the quality of the soil. Also working with renewable types of, um, you know, cold storage uh, for for produce, as well as um, working with, you know, solar water pumps um, and other kinds of solar dryer and dehydration facilities that are uh, managed by solar or dehydrate or um, uh, or essentially renewables. So I think that there's, um, you know, a lot of innovation in the space to see a, a massive shift. I think we need to also change, um, you know, consumer habits as well. So um, moving towards plant-based meat, moving towards um, changes in nutrition where we're not, you know, um, making sure we're essentially kind of uh, allowing consumers to choose between um, uh, certain types of um, more chemically organic or chemically sort of uh, produced food to something that is um, much more uh, hospitable for the for the climate and I think there's there's um, a lot more room for innovation there so I think in addition to that, we need to see technology really coming into agriculture in a big way. So whether, whether it's precision agriculture through drone technology, figuring out um, the best ways in which the climate can climate risks and climate analytics can be actually used for surveillance is, is very interesting as well. And I think secondly, um, hydroponics and vertical farming. So making sure that we have ways in which we can, you know, grow um grow crops, et cetera, in controlled environments and making sure that, that that's not impacted by, by the adverse effects of climate change. So there's a lot to do with, I think, adaptation and resilience here in in agriculture space that, that we can do. We can actually invest a lot of time and, um, and capital into as well as upskilling the existing farmer base. 
So ju just to, to go back to my, uh, my initial questions, like, uh, and we'll close this uh, section soon and, uh, and go back into the detail of uh, the adventure, but uh, where does India stand in terms of, uh, I mean, climate tech uh, today uh, as the ecosystem? Are we still at the genesis of it? Uh, do you see some uh, maturity starting? Who are the, the drivers behind that? And and if you had like, a, you know, a crystal ball, like uh, which subcategory of the climate ecosystem, ecosystem India could be the champions uh, in the next 10 or 20 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think climate tech is very nascent still in India. I think the whole term and terminology got coined only about a year ago, and it's been applied across, um, you know, the various sort of venture investing um, sort of uh, language right now. Um, it's still early because I think we're seeing only a few rounds that have been um, done for, for early stage companies. So perhaps I think two or three rounds of capital that have been invested in the first cohort of climate tech companies. And we're seeing, you know, a very encouraging set of early stage investors as well as accelerators and incubators and university hubs that are coming up to um, really support and foster this ecosystem which is great and in, in addition to that we're seeing a lot of sector agnostic investors actually creating climate tech verticals within their funds so similar to you have a fintech or a consumer tech ed tech vertical you would have a, a climate tech one um, but I do think there's a long way to go um, I think if we look at you know more developed markets like um, the US or the UK, they have um, many, many more climate specific funds. And even within climate, you have prop tech specific funds, or you have, um, you know, agriculture climate specific funds, or EV energy specific funds. funds. Yeah. yeah, energy. So the, the, that's something that still needs to evolve a little bit in India, you have the first signs of a few early players that are coming up with specific focuses um, within verticals. Um, so that's still needs to um, you know take fruition and I think um, there is an uh, yeah a lot of a lot to learn I think in terms of uh, from India what can actually be built for India and then built for the world um, in terms of technology um, I would say that India in terms of software is is one of the the leaders in the world so if there's um, you know you can basically kind of throw a rock and then you'll have like five software engineers in India <laughs> waiting to um, to work with you so it's it's a very big um, uh, area of expertise, I think. Um, with so, if there are models in climate that can be built as software layers over over and above the hardware of the manufacturing layers, that's I think where we can excel as as a country and as a talent pool. Uh, when it comes to deep tech, though, I think there's still some lessons that we need to learn from other uh, sort of economies, like for example Israel or Germany or the U.S., where there's really that deep rooted. Um, experience and understanding of, of deep technologies and, you know, things like battery chemistry and green hydrogen and, um, you know, some of the, and, you know, even energy storage, some of the uh, deeper parts of, of technology that perhaps need to be, um, the, the need to be fleshed out a little bit more. So I think we have a few areas that we can really excel. Um, I think India as a demographic, as I mentioned, second largest uh, population in the world has the ability to have a tremendous uptake if, if there is uh, adoption on the consumer side. So that's, uh, something that you know large platform models and marketplace models can definitely make a huge dent into so i think that's something that we can look forward to from from a country like india so a couple of more uh, question uh, and then we'll move to the to the next point like um According to you, like, what makes you think that, uh, in a way, economic growth is compatible with sustainability and reducing, you know, global emission? I mean, we often hear that uh, uh, the only way to go should be degrowth uh, for some some people. So, what's your what's your take on that? You think there is a, a potential, uh, you know, uh, growth uh, within, you know, like. Uh, changing and shifting all of those uh, you know old uh, system uh, without affecting like uh, the, the the growth and being sustainable at the same time yeah i think that um to that that's an interesting question i think technology has really made it possible for us to grow and be sustainable at the same time i think many different innovations if you even think to going back to the power sector um you know it, rigidity that earlier used to be a very kind of um two-way bilateral pur power purchase agreements. Now you see an innovation in technology where you can have, you know, over-the-counter uh, exchanges, you can have trading, you can have private markets coming in and, and um, you know, lowering all the inefficiencies that used to take place um, in the market. You have retail investors potentially coming in and, um, you know, uh, sort of investing in renewable energy assets. And you have, you know, AI and ML platforms that are, are making traditionally CapEx businesses much faster to scale. Um, so I think there is definitely 
an ability for if you set as a company, if you set your sustainability goals at a certain you know threshold or you want to reach uh, a certain target um, by 2030 or by 2040, I think investing in the right type of technology uh, to, to help you do it and hiring that team to build out uh, those platforms and to build out those um, proficiencies can can really help you reach there a lot faster while minimizing cost and wastage and you know um, all of those aspects along the way. So I think that's really the answer. And we're fortunately at a time where our technology expertise, um, as as you know, the, as, on a global scale, has really caught up with with the fact that now we need to use those technology skills to really address the climate crisis. And I'm talking about other things as well, like you know potentially blockchain. Uh, so utilizing um, you know smart contracts and and uh, different types of Web three innovations to really address multiple different um, uh, parts of the climate tech uh, verticals that can actually help us address problems a lot faster. So these these areas I think are now converging in a very um, you know fortuitous way to, to help us use these tools to achieve sustainability goals um, in a much more efficient manner. So with the goal, uh, you know, in mind to keep this uh, 1.5, um, you know, overall temperature increase by 2050, uh, what is according to you the, the, the proportion of uh, tech versus nature-based solution that uh, should be implemented at the Indian uh, market level? And uh, do you believe that uh, both of them are important or one of them should be pushed more than, uh, than the others? I mean, what, what's your view on, uh, on that? Yeah, I think nature-based solutions are really the answer in a country like India, where you have 25% of India is covered in forests, you have a huge amount of oceans, um, mangroves, a large amount of carbon sinks that are already existing and initiatives to do much more reforestation. Um, so that's where I, th I can see, you know, a huge amount of edge and differentiation that India has over other countries um, where the land mass, I mean, I think uh, India is like, I think the second most cultivable farmland in the world after the US. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for India to make that um, shift and to be that kind of uh, a player, um, for, uh, I mean, even savior for the world in terms of um, the amount of carbon emissions that can be absorbed. So uh, that's something that India should really focus on rather than the technology based solutions like the carbon capture, etc, where I still think we also need to upskill ourselves as a country to kind of reach the same uh, sophistication of technology that you would normally see in other countries. Um, but that's something that's best done, I think, outside of India, I think we should focus on, on the nature-based solutions as of now when we're looking at overall um, uh, the, the addressing the carbon problem. Thank you so much for sharing all of those very uh, interesting insights. So let's go into the specific of uh, Terra Venture. Can you tell us a bit more about like the, the, the story of it, the genesis, uh, and what was the initial gap uh, that uh, you guys saw, um, you know, that led uh, the thesis behind uh, Terra Venture? Yeah, so we started um, last year, April 2021. Um, I think the gap that we saw in the market was really the funding gap for technology-based um, solutions that are addressing the climate crisis and, um, you know, working towards achieving net zero emissions. So this was done along, I mean, this pr thought process sort of happened along the, the lines of us also um, being very encouraged by the positive uh, regulatory push towards electric vehicles and renewable energy and India's commitment towards net zero in COP26 last year. Um, so I think what we see ourselves is really one of the capital enablers um, in this space, working with very early stage companies to really seed them at that uh, sort of um, nascent stage and help them to grow um, and become you know, larger players in the ecosystem and hopefully multiply their impact on an environmental and social scale as well. Um, so what we do is um, we essentially find these companies that are building really nascent, uh, I would say not nascent, but more like first mover technologies um, that no one else is doing because it's two years ahead of the time or three years ahead of the time and really push them um, you know towards getting more commercial capital on board so if we funded them last year I think the objective is to uh, to help them with with the next round of funding this year and to really get more commercial um, you know sector agnostic funds interested in the space as well and give them that that room to basically um, capture a much larger of the market share with a larger pr proportion of capital that we would be um, you know the first uh, first funders essentially to come in so that's um the goal behind uh, the kind of uh, capital that we are deploying and of course it's not just capital where we're you know very much involved in our portfolio companies in terms of their strategy and talent development and product roadmap and and overall um, guidance to, to help them uh, grow as, as much larger companies and so that's uh, we sit on the board of at least two of our companies so we're very much uh, an active investor so that's that's essentially the the, the thought process behind how the Ventures was formed 
Okay, and and I mean, how do you source those uh, those different founders? I mean, what's your what's your strategy uh, and uh, operation behind uh, behind that? And like, when when you find those founders, you mentioned that you are you get involved uh, into supporting them. Uh, but what are the, the challenge maybe that uh, that you see that are specific to to them that uh, you guys try to uh, you know to support to for them to to go to the next uh, next round? Maybe you can speak about uh, one of you know as an example one of the previous investment that you. Uh, that you recently uh, did as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, we source our companies through a multitude of different channels. Um, we essentially have, you know, accelerators and incubators and, um, uh, and you know, other funds that basically refer companies to us, either, you know, partner funds at our seed stage level or even um, upstream funds that are asking us at the Series A stage to look at seed stage companies that they might be interested in later, but they are not able to fund. So um, that's a kind of combination. We also do, so that's, you know, inbound we also do a lot of outbound sourcing too where we reach out to companies directly um you know through linkedin or through other referrals or you know um uh, boot camps etc um and what we essentially do before we we reach out to anyone or take any calls um, is essentially build our own view of what the sector looks like so we spent about three or four months last year building an industry scan of the entire climate tech ecosystem in india benchmarking it to what has been already done in the US um, in terms of similar companies um, and also working out you know the subsectors within each sector and where the biggest growth opportunity is for us and do we want to be an asset light investor do we are we sort of um, looking at underwriting risks um, more in the manufacturing or the capex side of the businesses um, you know where do we see the most amount of um, threats in terms of uh, you know uh, I would say policy threats or supply chain threats etc and and where do we see us playing a bigger role so that's essentially helped us to inform get informed about where the biggest opportunities are so we get convinced about a space convinced about a thesis and then go and talk to companies you know all of the companies that are basically doing xyz underneath um in, in our view of, of where the opportunity lies um that's on the sourcing side and then i would say um you know the companies that we're trying to support um or we are supporting rather that are, are you know very early in the space so i'll take an example of one of the companies we supported last year uh, it's a company called canvaloop in the sustainable fashion space um and essentially, they, they take um, raw materials that are alternatives to uh, cotton, polyester, nylon, acrylic. And the last three that I mentioned are all oil-based. Um, so obviously, have a bunch of microplastics that go into textiles and, and fabrics. And then cotton, of course, is a natural crop um, from agricultural you know, cultivation, but it uses a huge amount of water, so there's a lot of wastage. So this company is looking at alternatives to these um, to go into our uh, sort of textile fibers and textile yarns. Um, and so they look at hemp, pineapple, banana, and then they use these, uh, they can use material conversion to actually convert these um, fibers into textile grade fibers, which they then sell to global brands like Levi's and Adidas and others. Um, so when we first, um, you know, sort of met this company, they were obviously boot bootstrapped and they were doing really well. They actually have a textile background. So the founder comes from, you know, fourth generation textile uh, company, uh, sort of uh, an exposure, and then essentially is able to already have a B2B connects to all of these fashion brands. So from a, um, a market perspective, we knew that they, they didn't need much in terms of um, connections, but it was more um, the larger global landscape. So um, helping him to get to the next level of growth, introducing him to capital providers that didn't really understand the space of sustainable fashion, but in India at least, and but but making sure that we they saw the market opportunity uh, for all of these different materials, R and D and material innovation, but also on the on the manufacturing side, and. You know, helping him as as a as a founder as well to kind of um, see see what what potential opportunities there are to be venture driven. Um, so uh, that that was an, a very it is a very interesting kind of uh, experience to be sort of one of the first funders of a company um, and and helping them uh, basically articulate what the the value proposition is and what um, the need of this uh, this whole solution is in a, in a changing market where brands are changing their requirements where um, you know the government push is also there as an ESG push to to regulate um, the uses of inputs into into fabric and into clothes and in the whole circular economy space so this is extremely nascent in India this entire concept but of course it's very um, it's very much a big question um, and, and something that's being addressed in, in Europe and, and the US and you know, it's a trillion dollar industry in terms of sustainable fashion so there's a lot uh, to, to know about so it's basically helping helping with the whole knowledge and evangelical um, you know nature of, of making sure that people understand his solution and that's what we essentially helped with in addition to a bunch of other things like um, you know product guidance and talent and, um, and governance and you know uh, other aspects of the business. 
So, uh, according to you, I mean, after this uh, this deep dive review on the different uh, you know subcategories and sectors and the uh, climate tech uh, uh, ecosystem in uh, in India in the different industry that uh, will be impacted by uh, by it, like which are the the sector that you know you believe are the most promising for you today in terms of like what I call the impact cash return or ICR, so meaning building impactful uh, companies while creating a highly profitable business. Do you see any underdogs or subsectors, uh, areas that you're very excited about? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, when we did the scans, we found that there were a bunch of different, um, you know, hidden areas where other people were maybe not looking at um, or maybe had time to sort of evaluate. Um, I think one area which was very exciting to us was energy storage. Um, so there's a company in our portfolio called Sheru, which essentially builds um, energy storage software over batteries um, and helps um, grid operators essentially understand where they have a shortfall in, in, in sort of the grid and the stability of the grid, they can use battery energy storage to, to sort of plug back in that, but they actually pay for a subscription um, software solution to sort of see the movement of the, the batteries and the analytics that can be provided there. So I think that's a huge opportunity um, that, you know, we, we discovered through the scan and that we were lucky enough to, to meet this company that was doing just this and, and in the process of launching that solution. Um, similarly, I think in the material space, we're really excited about all the different innovation that is there. So for building materials, for example, as I mentioned, building um, you know, emit 40% of all carbon emissions. So looking at alternatives to, uh, you know, carbon tiles and cement and, and other forms of building construction and looking at more sustainable um, agriculture based or other based um, types of uh, inputs, as well as into um, areas like packaging and fashion, where which is seeing a huge shift right now and huge consumer conscious and awareness and brands, um, you know, large FMCG brands that are being forced uh, to look at extended producer responsibility and the entire circular uh, solution as well. Um, so that's where we see a, a huge opportunity. Another area that we hadn't anticipated last year, but we're seeing a lot of um, exciting movement in is the whole concept of carbon credits and the voluntary carbon markets and um, and how that translates to um, to sort of projects that are happening on the ground and how India actually, because, because as I mentioned, um, the sort of propensity and the capability to harness a lot of nature based um, solutions can actually be one of the large um, players in this space. So finding companies that are working in the space and doing some interesting work on, on sort of um, software solutions on Web3, on catalyzing uh, all of these innovations in carbon credits and plastic credits and other types of credits um, and making it very easy to transact and incentivize uh, companies um, to move towards net zero is something that's that's pretty exciting to us. Um, lastly, I think what we are, we're seeing, you know, obviously there's EV, there's grid, there's renewable. Um, you know, we're also looking at the property tech space. So I mentioned building materials, but there's also a lot of work on energy efficiency and uh, clean air, indoor, uh, indoor air quality um, that we're looking at with a lot of interest as well and the whole concept of green leases and green buildings. So, um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of scope for um, exciting innovation. That's super exciting. So how do you, uh, how do, you do to cover all of those uh, different topics uh, with uh, such a small team? So congrats on you guys. <laughs> so on, on <laughs> the opposite you. side, like w which are the, the, the one that, uh, I mean, according to you, uh, the, the, the solution that uh, you believe in a way makes no sense whatsoever and it's not like more like, uh, you know, waste of time, resource or even greenwashing. Do you have maybe a, you know, one or two examples of like, you know, uh, startups without naming them, uh, but a uh, concept or something that uh, were proposed to you guys and you're like, no, it's just like you label it, uh, you know, as climate tech, but in fact, uh, the impact is uh, limited or like uh, uh, under zero. So do you have any examples on, on the other side of that? Um, we actually haven't come across them, so I'm, I'm not able to comment too much on this. Um, I haven't seen, uh, at least in the Indian context, any startups that are claiming to be greenwashing. It's too early to say, I think, at this point in time. Um, potentially, if I was looking at other markets that have been, where climate has been more active for about four or five years, um, I do think that, yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, the greenwashing element, I think is something more in corporates that one would see as more of a, you know, potential um, uh, side effect or tendency of the regulator clamping down on carbon emissions and carbon disclosures, which actually in India, unlike in, in the US where you have the Securities and Exchange Commission actually mandating, um, you know, carbon disclosures here in India, we haven't seen that so much. So uh, the evasion or, you know, lack of transparency and disclosures is something that hasn't, um, uh, you know, come about as, as much of it. But I'm sure we're going to see it over the next few years as 
as we go through this transition. So how do you measure impact? I mean, comparison to uh, other funds, uh, you do not mention any specific criteria in terms of like CO2, you know, tons of CO2 removed. Uh, or like, do you have any specific process or frameworks? Do you rely on maybe on scientists and experts to validate uh, the take on the impact? Or it's really too early uh, in terms of like the, the companies that you look and, and work with and that the impact side in a way is uh, a bit more on the side side. What's your, uh, what's your process there and yeah. like uh, the way we see it? Yeah, so it is quite early in the stage that we're looking at companies um, to have, um, I mean, obviously we have desired metrics that we want to um, measure, but some of these companies that we're investing in are only like a year old or maybe less. Um, so they have vision of what they want to measure. But yes, tons of metric tons of CO2 emitted, um, you know, uh, amount of uh, energy transmitted that is renewable and clean energy. Um, and then, you know, I think for us also, um, the combination of impact and financial return is is very important to us. So the more a company scales up and becomes uh, larger in terms of scope and, and also in terms of revenue and profitability, the more, the higher the impact. Um, so we see it as very closely entwined. Of course, I think as we evolve as a fund, I think the objective is to come up with very strong, um, you know, metrics that are uh, that are also tied into um, to, to sort of global standards as well um, and global indices uh, around ESG and, and around sustainability that we can kind of um, have our companies, you know, um, benchmark themselves to, and then eventually for us to come up with a kind of impact measurement or impact report that that sort of um, really highlights that uh, the achievement of our companies um, towards this uh, these goals. But as of now, um, it's still uh, you know a work in progress. So what's next for the adventure? Yeah, so we are actually, um, you know, uh, launching a larger fund right now, um, a seed stage fund uh, focused on Indian climate tech ventures, um, you know, building on the track record that we have done over the last or we have uh, achieved over the last um, 15 months or so. Um, so actively looking for companies that can, um, you know, uh, fulfill the criteria that we have technology first IP led companies um, in, you know, frontier uh, sort of uh, first mover type of categories within climate tech doing something really innovative and that um, would be interested to partner with us. So I think we're, we're always on the lookout and would, would love for, for any of these founders to, to approach us. Um, I would like to say I'm also, um, you know, very closely affiliated uh, as a director on the board of a company uh, or a, a nonprofit foundation called Sustainability Mafia, which is a group of very passionate, um, you know, mission oriented founders. Um, and that's an example of um, a coalition that has come together over the last two years or so of uh, very, very uh, motivated founders that all want to make a, a massive, um, you know, impact in the future of sustainability. So I have had the sort of privilege of working closely with them and, and mentoring and evolving um, the whole group as, as it grows and, um, and also learning from them quite a bit on how do we scale this whole concept of sustainability in India. So looking forward to kind of, because we are very much a founder, founder first type of fund as well. So looking forward to working closely with, with these types of founders. As, as we go on. So what's your uh, personal view on the, on the climate crisis? I mean, as I always ask to, uh, to the different uh, guests on the interview, like, are we doomed? Uh, what would you say to, to people who sees and feels those uh, already con visible consequences uh, uh, that uh, on, on climate change right now? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. I think um, I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but I do think we are addressing the problem um, a bit late in the game. So I think if we had woken up at the time of the Rio summit back in the early 90s, um, we could have averted a lot of the impacts on you know climate or the weather issues that we're seeing right now um, and uh, wildfires and floods and and you know um, heat waves that we're all, we're just going to see more and more of those the melting of the ice caps etc. So it's just a question of you know getting to the problem three decades too late um, is is going to you know. Um, really, really force us to go through that entire mindset shift. As I mentioned, the next generation is really going to have to take climate as basically um, a uh, sort of um, default uh, choice. So they're going to, every second that they're thinking about making decisions has to factor in uh, climate and sustainability and less wastage and more conservation related because otherwise um, it really is going to be too late. Uh, so I think we as a, you know, middle generation, I would say, um, you know, making that a, a sort of the next wave of, of companies investing in them and, and pushing policymakers uh, really have to be conscious that for the planet to really be livable, um, I would say for the next generation, I would say generation alpha, which is um, the folks that are born 
born in 2010 and after. So all, all of our kids essentially will, will, you know, for us to make the planet livable for them, we have to change like very, very rapidly and make these, these, um, these, these sort of seismic shifts in the way that we're um, managing our um, uh, everything to do with our everyday lifestyle, but also pushing corporations to um, to move move the needle. Um, and I think this decade will be very important. Let's see where we end up in 2030. I do think that um, 1.5 degrees is is it's it's probably going to happen. So that's something that we just have to be aware of. And maybe if dangerous impacts are going to be kicking in, maybe helping um, you know think about ways in which we can come up with um, climate adaptation and resilience formulations that um, you know can help us avoid um, loss of life and loss of biodiversity if we have you know twenty thousand uh, x more of the wildfires and the floods and the uh, heat waves that are affecting our ecosystem. Um, so coming up with tools that can help us pre preempt this is is important. But more importantly, I think um, you know undergoing that entire shift um, in business consumer society uh, right now is 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 of utmost importance. So how can the community of uh, you know investors, founders, experts listening to the the show can help you? Yeah, I think we we all need to come together and start funding more innovations and com and companies in this space. Um, and just having that open dialogue, talking uh, across the table, exchanging ideas, and making I think sustainability across all all the different types of um, you know uh, sort of investing uh, mindset and, and mandate. So even if you're investing in say a fintech company or you're investing in you know a gaming company or an edtech company or a consumer goods goods company, um, making sure that you integrate sustainability into all of those um, uh, you know business models and value chains is going to be hugely important because I think um, without that we are in, in sort of uh, quite uh, dicey territory I would say so um, and starting also with um, education with with you know uh, sort of schools and and curriculum and making sure that when people go to business school etc they're learning not just about the capitalist um, sort of um, mandate, etc., but also about the climate mandate. So, uh, I think that's that's going to be a fundamental shift. And the more um, people that are there evangelizing this movement, um, the faster we will reach our net zero goals. So, any question I should have uh, asked and I did not for this uh, first part of the interview? No, I think you covered everything. So, thank you for <laughs> all the insightful questions. I'm glad to have the opportunity to answer them. So thank you so much, uh, Priya, for your, uh, your time, your incredible insights on the, on the industry, on the climate tech uh, ecosystem uh, in India. Super excited to, uh, to see this uh, report coming out, uh, thanks to uh, your collaboration. Uh, and very excited to see so many brilliant people like you, uh, you know, putting so much time and effort uh, towards a better and cleaner world. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Hi, it's Guillaume again. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. As I said, do not hesitate to share an episode with a friend. Also, if you value the work we do for the climate tech ecosystem, here is how you can contribute to it. Today, I'm asking for your support and a donation or sponsorship to make the work of our self-funded team more viable. Even a small contribution means a lot to us. In any case, I will invite you to subscribe to our channels and visit our website startupbasecamp.org to discover more episodes like this one and get your membership to access all our members' exclusive content. So remember, all of this is possible because of your support and donation. And we want you to be part of this collective movement against climate change. Let's keep in touch and I hope you will enjoy our next show with us.